Well, welcome to our first face-to-face -face meeting since, I, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at my notes, January February. 2020, no, it was February. Yes. February 2020 was the last one, and I think we were, I don't know what happened to the March one, I don't know if it was COVID or a storm, I don't think we had a January meeting COVID. that year with the storm. COVID. But anyway, I am so glad to see you all. I am Becky Strickland, I am the secretary. This is fact, the Philadelphia Association for Critical Thinking, and yes, I do need this crib sheet because I will forget something important. As you know, we support reason and science and the use of the scientific method to evaluate claims. Thank you very much to, for Dr., to Dr. David Cattell for arranging this room. Thank you for the College Physics Department that provides it to us. Who is here from the college or another school? Yay. Welcome. Who is here from Meetup? <laughs> Did anybody find this from another source? Just words gotten around. Okay, that's great. Please see our website, www.fact.org, for more information about us or to join as an actual member for $25 a year. The uh, membership and donations help us sponsor quality speakers like Dr. Vise and pays for excursions and our summer picnic, which are open to all. Dereva, do you have anything to add? No, um, you can become a member at www.fact.org. We accept PayPal. We're a 501c3 registered nonprofit, so all donations and memberships are tax deductible to the extent of United States law. So please support us for wonderful opportunities and events like this. All right. um, our speaker today is Dr. Stuart Vise, Stuart Vise, who is a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry if you're not sure what that is, help yourself to some magazines up here <laughs> and look at the beginning uh, at the first inside page. Um, he is a psychologist, a professor, speaker, and author who will talk about his current book, The Uses of Delusion. And right after the meeting, these, this is for sale for $20, and this book, um, Superstition, a very short introduction, is for sale for $5, and you take Venmo, right? I do. Okay. I don't know what that is, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in the room. We do. Yeah. And if you've been here before, you know we have a Q&A afterwards. So thank you, Dr. Thank you, Becky. I'm going to use this. If, is it it's working? Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's so nice to be here. I, I gave, I think, at least one prior talk to FACT. Uh, during the pandemic over Zoom. So it's really nice to be here. I feel honored to be the first in, you know, face, uh, what was it, face to face? With face to face. Five. Face to face. I thought that sounded a little years. aggressive. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I'm really happy to be here. And, uh, and also I have some uh, friends with me too. So it's great. Uh, so I'm going to get started and uh, uh, I hope you can. Um, Follow along. Let's see if this is all going to work. So, the, oh, this, there's a the obligatory self-promotional part at the very beginning. So, this is the the book for which I'm probably the most well known, if I'm well known at all, uh, called *Leaving Magic: The Psychology of Superstition*. And this little book is a sort of a follow-up uh, to it, um, and which goes into the history of superstition. It was actually I'm a psychologist, but this is a very general look in a small format uh, at the whole story of superstition from, from beginning to end. Uh, and it was hard to write, actually, because I had to learn a lot in order to write it. Uh, but, but it was very gratifying when it was done, and I was honored to be part of this series. I don't know if you know about this series. It, and you see these kiosks, and there are all these, I think there are up to 650 titles now. Um, so, what I do on a regular basis is to write for Skeptical Inquirer magazine, which I think is a magazine that some of you have heard of before, uh, and there are some copies out here, uh, both online and, uh, and in the magazine itself. I, I chose that particular one because I love that little kid uh, on the cover. Uh, so anyway, and, and so this is the book I'm talking about today. And it is available in all the formats, hardcover, audio, and Kindle, and so forth. Um, so <clears throat> I've done a number of talks on this book, 
And I found that the best way to do it is to slice it up and to talk about different parts of it for different talks. And so today's topic is the mind's best trick. Uh, now these are the artsy titles of the chapters, right? That don't give you any idea what's really going on inside. So here's the translations. Uh, you know, these are the, the actual topics uh, of each of those sort of central chapters of the book. And uh, I did give a talk back in May for the Skeptical Inquirer Presents, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, on uh, delusions of personality, and that's, that's online for anybody who wants to. But today's topic is free will, and, the, and what I'm gonna suggest is that free will, our sense of free will is a delusion, but a useful one. Um, and I chose this topic because the room is full of skeptics, we're really smart, and I thought it's the most challenging topic, I think, in the book, uh, but I thought you as an audience would be up to it. Uh, I wrote the book in such a way that, that there were easier chapters going up to this one, and I thought that I might get some, you know, get some momentum going uh, as you read through the chapters and credibility would, would ensue, and you'd believe everything I had to say about free will in the last chapter. I don't have that advantage today, but we'll do our best anyway. So this is a book about not being rational, right? It says, the subtitle is, Why It's Not Always Rational to Be Rational. And so as I started to write this book, as a member of the skeptics community such as it is, I, I said, this is the book that's going to get you kicked out of the club. You know, you, this, this, is, this doesn't seem like the right, the right message for your, for your clan. Uh, and yet I hope that that's not the case and that, that you will see that there is some, there is some method to my madness. Uh, but first, before we can find out what it means to be irrational, we might spend a minute or two talking about what it means to be rational. And so I'm gonna do that. Um, so there are lots of different theories about rationality, philosophers and others, economists. Uh, but, and I'm not gonna to try to cover all of them, but I'm gonna throw out a few ideas that, that might help ground us. Uh, philosophers do talk about at least two different kinds of rationality. One is epistemic, which epistemology is about knowledge and ideas and truth, right? And so, so one is you're rational if, you're, if you have good beliefs, right? And under, under this type of format. Then a second kind is instrumental rationality. Given you've got those beliefs, do your actions then follow from them rationally? Are you, are you then doing what your beliefs should drive you to do? And so, so these two things represent also, obviously, two ways that you can be irrational, right? If you're, not, if you're not grounding your beliefs the right way, or if you're not acting in the right way given those beliefs. So, uh, so this is a helpful beginning. Uh, this is, this is, I think, the only diagram in the, in the whole talk. Uh, so this is a little bit of a schematic of, of what, it, what economists primarily, but also philosophers, refer to as rational choice theory. Um, there are other versions of it, but this is a simple one. And so you have the box, which is the person, and uh, the person has desires, as we all do. Uh, and then on the other side of the box, the person also has beliefs, right? And so the beliefs, in order to be good beliefs, according to the theory, they have to be grounded in information. And the little circle is meant to indicate that, that you may have to repeat some search for information and data in order to eventually have good beliefs. And then once you've established those beliefs, those can drive your actions with respect to the world. On the left-hand side, there are some desires, like if, if I'm thirsty, I don't have to form a belief before I pick up the thing. I just do it, right? I just, I just act on it. But other, other actions have to be grounded in some kind of rational view. At least that's what the philosophers would tell us. Um, the broken line in the middle is, is, uh, is part of the model that is a, is a no-no. Uh, you're not supposed to believe something simply because it, it meets your desires, right? And so, so that, that line, that path, is the path of irrationality, one of them. And, and, and yet, some of the things that are in this book fit into that. This, is, this would be referred to as wishful thinking, right? The, the idea that I, and this is true because I want it to be true, or, or it would be good for me if it were true. So, 
Um, now, one of the interesting things about rational choice model, and I'm going to try to watch a little video clip here. I hope it, I hope it works. Um, is that you can be rational according to the model? You can be rational but wrong, right? And because you may not have adequate information, you you know, that you you can only you can only do the best you can. The model suggests that people just do what they, the best they can under the circumstances. And if you don't have good information, then that's true. So how many people remember being told? I'm kind of there are younger people in the audience. I'm kind of curious about this. How many people were told that you had to wait 30 minutes or an hour after eating before you could get in the water? Good, that's it. but some of you were not. That's, that's good. Cool. Yeah, yeah, right, <clears throat> it was, right? So is that true? Let's find out what the Mayo Clinic has to say about that. It's advice parents have been giving their children for generations. When I was growing up, I remember my mother telling me, you know, not to go in the pool until it was 30 to 60 minutes after I, I had my last meal. Dr. Michael Boniface, an emergency medicine physician at Mayo Clinic, says he remembers the anticipation all kids experience waiting those 30 to 60 minutes to pass before he could jump back in the water. The old feeling was that after you eat, some of the blood may be diverted to your gut so that you can digest, diverting the bloodstream away from your arms and legs and you make it tired or fatigued and be more likely to drown. But is this recommendation to wait based on fact or fiction? And we know now that really there is no scientific basis for that recommendation. You may end up with some stomach cramping or a muscle cramp, but this is not a dangerous activity to routinely enjoy. So while it might not be the most comfortable thing to go for a swim with a full belly, the world won't end if you ignore your mom's advice just this once and don't wait 30 to 60 minutes. For the Mayo Clinic News Network, I'm Ian Roth. I would never encourage not obeying your mother's orders. So that, that's not not my message. But but yeah. So here's the, it had a kind and it had a kind of logic, right? It seemed logical that there might be a problem, uh, and uh, and but there was actually no data to back it up. And so it took a while before people were able to reject that that view. So it was rational at the time. Uh, but wrong, and now now it would be rational to do the right thing. Now we do have data with respect to alcohol, right? You should not have three martinis and then get in the pool. That is that is dangerous. There is mortality data to uh, to back that up. But in terms of the other, so it's an interesting aspect of the of the model, the the sort of subjective nature of the model. Another uh, thing that I talk about in the book with respect to rationality, and this has specific interest for skeptics. Is, and critical thinkers, is the, the debate between uh, uh, William Clifford and William James. Anybody heard of, the, of Clifford before on this issue? Anyway, Clifford would be, uh, was a, a British mathematician and, uh, and philosopher, and he would be described as a hardcore skeptic. He, he believed that you should, not have, you should not hold any belief whatsoever on insufficient data, ins insufficient knowledge. And there's a famous story of um, the ship owner who had a ship, uh, and he writes about it in this essay, The Ethic, Ethics of Belief. Uh, and the ship owner had some worries that his ship was no longer seaworthy, that it was getting old and might, might not sail very well. But it was filled with, with people going off to the new world. And you know, what he, his way of dealing with his doubts was to, was to simply push them out of his mind, you know, to, to just, just ignore those worries and go ahead and let the ship go. You know, he wasn't going to be on it, so that, that may have had something to do with it. Uh, but uh, but um, so, so, of course, according to the story, and it's a, it's a fictional story, but according to the story, the ship then went out and sank in the middle of the ocean. He collected his insurance money and felt no, no, none the worse for wear because of it. Obviously, Clifford said that he held that belief on insufficient knowledge and it was wrong to push it out of his mind. But Clifford went even further to suggest that even a private belief that you never act on, you never express to anyone else, and you never act on whatsoever, it's wrong to hold that belief without sufficient evidence. Because he said it would create a certain an attitude of credulity uh, you would begin to believe other things that ultimately would, would have implications for you or for society. So it was a very hard nose. And, and the implications for belief in God were obvious. He made it very clear that they, this, is, this, is, this is about uh, religion as well, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't believe in, in a God without, without evidence. Well, James comes along uh, and 
some, many of you are probably familiar with William James, American psych philosopher uh, and psychologist, but, but mostly philosopher in my view. Uh, he he uh, was a scientist and, and you know, a great thinker, uh, and he responded directly to Clifford's piece. Sadly, it was after Clifford had died, so he couldn't respond back. But, but James really sort of uh, poo-pooed the hardcoreness of, of, uh, of Clifford's viewpoint and suggested that there were times when you were justified in holding a belief without sufficient evidence to back it up if there were positive aspects of that belief for you, if, if, it, if it brought benefit to you. And, uh, and his, he, of course, you know, you may be familiar with the fact that James was a believer in spiritualism. He believed in an afterlife and he tested a number of spiritualists in the Boston area in particular, and he, he had found one named Leonora Piper who he believed really could communicate with the dead. Uh, she she was just a really good charlatan, I believe. But <laughs> but uh, but nonetheless, he 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 wanted to sort of make a little bit of a break in that skepticism, so that he could believe in in some kind of an afterlife. Um, and uh, so this is sort of where we are. It, my book is actually in some cases in the James camp. The idea that there are certain irrational behaviors or or beliefs that have positive benefit. And, and although they may not, in many of the cases, the beliefs may not appeal to everyone, it may not be something that everybody would, would want to do, I think just on an objective basis, I wanted to recognize that, that they do benefit people in certain ways. And I think that, uh, that the one on free will, I think, benefits us all. I, I'll get to that later. But this is the quote that sort of sums up James's view, of what, what is part of, the American pragmat pragmatist school of philosophy, that to develop a thought's meaning, we need only determine what conduct it is fitted to produce. That conduct is for us its sole significance. Now that's not gonna be something that people in this room are all going to buy in every case, but, but it's certainly the case in some cases. Okay, so here's the topic for today, finally, wherever I am in the, in the hour. Um, the mind's best trick, and that is the our feeling of, of free will. And I, I'm going to, my claim, uh, which I'm sure you will agree by the end of the talk, is that free will is a delusion, but it's a useful one. Okay, so this is a fairly famous Dilbert uh, cartoon. You probably can't read it. Um, I'll read it to you if I can. So the first thing he says, do you think the chemistry of the brain controls what people do? Dilbert, is that Dilbert right on the right there? He says, of course. Then how can we blame people for their actions? And then the next one, because people have free will to do as they choose. Are you saying that the free will is not part of the brain? Of course it is, but it's the part of the brain that's out there just being kind of free. So you're saying the free will part of the brain is exempt from the natural laws of physics. Obviously, otherwise we couldn't blame people for anything they do. Do you think the free will part of the brain is attached or does it just float out there nearby? <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, this is the conundrum, right? Is it is it, to, to some degree. And this is the libertarian view of free will is that we are just free and that we can, you know, that we have free will. It is the view that, that, that uh, I think is generally accepted by the public. And, and by by most people, not everybody, obviously, because some people have read my book. Um, okay, so free will. This this problem that, that is in the Dilbert cartoon is not a problem. Was not a problem for Descartes. Descartes was the, what we call a dualist. So he believed that there was a non-material soul that humans had and animals didn't have, uh, and he actually thought it was in the pineal gland. Uh, I don't know why he came up with that. It just central location or something, but that you know you can see it in the diagram here, um, and uh, and he believed that that uh, you know there was somehow a non-material soul that controlled our material body, uh, and, uh, and 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 that would be in contrast to someone who just thought it's all physical, uh, and so the question of course is how can a non-material soul 
actually influence something that is material, like our bodies. Uh, and that is the conundrum. So, so most of philosophers today have, have some, think that they have solved this problem. They have, they have something they call compatibilism. And compatibilism is the idea, and I, I, I've tried, I've spoken to many philosopher friends, and this is, by the way, the most popular position uh, held by philosophers, if, you know, I mean, according to surveys that have been conducted. Uh, that free will isn't incompatible with determinism, right? That we can have a deterministic universe that includes us, but somehow we're also free to make decisions, that the two are not incompatible. I don't get it, uh, but it, that it, they have sim somehow worked that out in their minds. Uh, uh, and so for me, it doesn't really make sense. Okay, so that's just the introduction. Now I'm going to give you what are sort of my three reasons why I think free will is an illusion or, or a delusion. Uh, the first is it doesn't make logical sense. Second, and the Dilbert cartoon is an example of this, our judgment about free will is biased by our desire to punish people or reward people. And third, uh, that the only evidence we have psychologically is a feeling, and those feelings are unreliable. And so uh, I'll go through those now. So the logic picture, this, I had to switch this one, the James Webb, I had, I had Hubble up there before, uh, you know, but, uh, but now that the Webb telescope is up, I, I have the Webb. But, so you've got the whole universe, right? Galaxies, stars, all this stuff happening. And we don't have any problem thinking about that huge thing there as being basically billiard balls, right? It's all just following the laws of physics it's not doing things because it's curious. It does things because that's the way the laws of physics go. And then, you know, on the right-hand panel, you have the famous little blue dot um, photograph, right? And that that tiny blue speck at the end of the of the arrow is Earth, right? So, 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 out of this huge thing of there, we have their free will is there at the end of that at the end of that arrow. And we'll zoom in, and then even when we get to Earth, and even when we get to, the, we, we separate out the organic stuff on Earth, it's still a very small group of species that we're talking about. You have, you have all these non bacteria and all this other stuff on the left-hand side. I keep pointing over here, you can't see that. And, uh, and then you have animals on that branch. And then you have, when you get to the animal species, you're still only talking about a few. I think that Somewhere, most people probably don't think that earthworms have free will. Maybe they do, I don't know. But somewhere in between bacteria or earthworms and us, there's a line. And only a small group of species in our little planet, there might be some other planets too, but you know, a tiny, tiny thing. And, and for that group of people, there have to be, or our species, there have to be special rules, right? That, that, that it's no longer a physical chemical Thing, there's some kind of a soul or there's something that's driving decisions and so on. So for me, that doesn't make sense that there would be special rules. Uh, why would there be special rules for us? And I would, I would argue that yes, it's more of a religious belief than it is an empirical one on, on, on that basis. Uh, and, and obviously it has been part of religion. Second argument, the tail wagging the dog. Um, this is that we, for social reasons, humans are an extremely social group, right? We, we, we depend on each other. The, the, you know, an infant, when it's born, cannot survive on its own, and we, have, we develop social groups and cultures and so forth in order to survive. Uh, in that process, we tend to want to reward certain actions that help the group and, other, and punish others that don't. And my view is that, that much of our feeling about free will comes from that desire to have that, that ability. And I'll demonstrate a case. So th there are many studies, it's interesting, there's a lot of interesting work in experimental philosophy that shows how we think about moral decisions. This is a study that sort of tells it in a, in a nutshell. Uh, this is a study uh, about, uh, in, in which participants read a scenario and, and be, be, you know, at some point in the study, they determined whether the, the, the P 
people who were in the study were either pro-life or pro-choice, right, in their personal viewpoints, right? And so then they read a scenario, and the scenario was about this woman named Sarah. She's pregnant, she goes to the doctor. The doctor tells her, yes, you are pregnant, but the fetus that you are carrying requires a special diet or it will die within a month, right? If you don't, if you don't yourself go on a special diet, the fetus will die within a month. Uh, Sarah goes home, she begins to have second thoughts, do I really want to be a parent, am I ready for this, and so forth, so she doesn't do this, the special diet. And then, and the fetus does die, as the doctor described. So then the participants were asked the question, did, did Sarah allow the fetus to die, or did she make the fetus die? And, and the, the, the view of abortion that the participant held determined very strongly how they viewed what Sarah had done. Uh, Pro-life participants said she made the fetus die. Now why? Because they felt that her actions were punishable, needed to be punished. And there's nothing, you know, there's nothing different about this scenario. Everybody read the same story, but what was different was the person's beliefs and, and how they felt about this action in their, in their group. Many other experiments along these lines that show that, that an action, the same action in a case where people want to punish the person is judged as being more free. Uh, he had a choice, he could have done differently. Uh, whereas in, in, the, you know, in a case where they, there's no need to punish the person, then there's less of that sense that they, that they, they did it freely. So it, there's no question that the evidence from research suggests that we, that our view of this of an action as to whether it was free or not free, uh, whether it was compelled, so on, that's very much affected by what how we feel about the action and, and what we want to do to that person. So this is the research that uh, that um, uh, really sort of you know drove it home for me, and, and there's a couple of psych psychologists, there's a psychologist named Daniel Wigner, uh, who has written a book called The Illusion of Conscious Will, and did a bunch of research on it, and by coincidence I had his daughter in one of my classes, and that's how I found out about his research, but, but he, he, was a, he unfortunately died of uh, ALS, and he was an unbelievably creative researcher at Harvard, uh, and so his view was that, that, that you know, what we have in the way of personal evidence about our free will is this feeling. We feel like we're doing something or not. And so he, I'm going to actually read a little episode that he reported in that book. It's a very short passage that shows one case. I start the chapter by describing two different cases in which the feeling of doing gets separated from the doing. And so here's the, here's the first one. It's a Saturday afternoon, and a man is visiting a toy store with his family. While his children peruse the aisles, he sidles up to a video game and begins to manipulate the joystick. He quickly becomes absorbed in guiding a monkey over the screen as it jumps over barrels and avoids other obstacles. Then suddenly the words, start game, pops up on the screen. For several minutes, the man had assumed the game was already underway and that he was playing it, but now he sees his mistake. The game was in demo mode, and the monkey was following a pre-recorded path across the screen. Although the man believed he was making the monkey jump and move, his manipulation of the joystick was completely irrelevant. It wasn't him. So that actually happened to, to Wegner himself, and he describes it in the book. So that's an example where he believed he was doing something when his actions were not relevant to the action at all. The other case is an opposite one, and it's one that some people in the room know quite a bit about, so I'll tell you about it. Oh, here's, first of all, first there's other examples of this, right? So I love this one. Um, first of all, I don't know if you know this or not, but in New York City, those of you who've been to New York City, I'm sure there's quite a few, uh, there are these crosswalks, right? Well, it turns out, according to the New York Times, most of them have been completely disconnected from the, from the thing. And, and yet, they, in order to save money, they didn't bother to remove them, right? So millions of button presses a day going on today, tomorrow, so on. 
And if the light changes, people believe that they've done something, right? They've made a response, the light has cooperated, and they feel as though they've, they've, they've done something. They have the act of doing, not true. Uh, same thing for elevator doors. Some of the closed door buttons have been disconnected in order to comply with ADA uh, requirements that, that the doors remain open for a certain period of time so that people can get in. And yet, you push the button if the door eventually closes. And it doesn't have to even close right away. Even if it closes just a little bit later, you still feel as though you, you had something to do with it. Uh, okay, so, but this is, this is the case, an, another case that ironically in a different area of my life I've been involved with. But, but Wegner also studied this, and this is the opposite effect. This is where you are doing something, but you feel like you're not. So this is the case of facilitated communication. How many people have heard of facilitated? Yeah, okay. Right, here we go. This is a brief clip from um, the movie Prisoners of Silence. <laughs> These children cannot speak. No one knows what's going on inside their heads. They're autistic. Tonight on Frontline, the explosive story of a revolutionary method of communication. Here was a means of expression for people who lacked expression. Here was a way that you could find out what people were feeling and what they were thinking. Frontline investigates facilitated communication. The theory, the practice, and the controversy God, it's really true. This stuff is bogus. You know, it's just so clear and so unmistakable. I was sitting there watching this. Six times two. Tonight on Frontline, Prisoners of Silence. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for... Okay, so, so the story is that this is a, a, a you know, a completely pseudoscientific method of communication where people hold their hands, hold the hand of another person, and they either type or they write. Uh, and unfortunately, this was made in the 90s, early 90s, and I'm sorry to say that it's this technique and variations of it are more popular today than ever before, despite the fact that this film went a long way to prove that it was, in fact, uh, a bogus communication technique. Simple uh, double-blind experiments show that when, when the person who's the helper, the facilitator, um, uh, doesn't know what the correct answer is, then the answers are all wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and, and when, even in simple identification things like, you know, apple, shoe, and so forth. So, so, uh, so it's, it's a completely bogus thing, but it's so attractive to many parents uh, and, and people you know who love uh, people without speech, and so so it's 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 been there are two my colleagues here in the room, uh, Amy Lutz and, and Catherine Beals, who are working with me to try to defeat this this uh, this, um, this thing, and and uh, it's been a problem. But for me as a psychologist, uh, what struck me immediately, and when I taught, I used to show this movie in every introductory psychology class I ever taught, because it's a, a beautiful example of how, in a simple way, science can really tell the truth about something that, that is not obvious. Um, but what struck me was the fact that the facilitators were not aware. I mean, this is getting back to free will and the feeling of doing, right? The facilitators literally did not, they, you, you'd think that they, were, that they were faking it, right? That they were lying, right? Not so. And, and so this, this section I'm about to show of the film was the part that struck me the most when I first came across it. So let's, oh, I have this, I have this. After using FC for over a year, the OD Hex Center in Schenectady began discussing whether they should do their own test of facilitated communication. My first reaction was, why would we ever want to test it? It's working. We, there were things that people, that individuals who typed with me typed that I didn't remember consciously being aware of. So I thought, well, that's proof enough. Why should we need to test these people? It's their communication. All right, find the one that's the same. Let's put it right in front of you. But just in thinking about it, I, then I wanted the research to be done because I thought it would prove 
once and for all without a doubt that it was these people communicating and that we were not influencing them in any way, shape, or form. I was convinced that it would prove their communication. A team of psychologists and facilitators led by Doug Wheeler devised a rigorous double-blind test. Well, this is what we had in mind. It's uh, just a simple T device, the table split down the middle. Um, myself as a researcher, I can stand back here. I'm pretty much out of view of the... Uh, the facilitator and autistic individual sat side by side with a screen dividing their visual field. Sometimes they were shown the same picture. Sometimes different ones. They tested 12 clients facilitating with nine staff members, many who were trained in Syracuse. They ran dozens of trials. The results were shocking. We literally really didn't get one correct response. I mean, it was unbelievable, really. Given, given you know, our prior belief systems about the whole thing. We, had, we ran 180 trials. There were 180 trials where valid communication could have been demonstrated and none, none did. We had overwhelming evidence for facilitator control. That was the main finding. So one and it began to dawn on us that the impact on the facilitators was going to be uh, traumatic. Um, their belief had grown to such an extent and was continuing to grow at that point where it really had become an essential part of their belief system, an essential part of their personality. And people would use phrases like, FC is my whole life, uh, FC is my life. Uh, these people were dedicated. They spent their own money doing training. They spent their own money to buy canned communicators. Um, the, the dedication was uh, was phenomenal. And we and we had evidence that these people were all controlling the typing, and we were cons we knew it was un unconscious. We knew these people had no idea they were controlling it. That that was clear. So uh, yeah, we began to be very concerned. It was devastating to to see the data just there in black and white in front of you. It, it was mind boggling. There was no arguing it. It was clear cut. Um, to see the look on Doug's face seated across the table from me, someone who I work with whose opinion I trust, whose work I trust, I knew you couldn't argue, I couldn't argue with those results. It was, it was devastating to look at it and see it there in black and white in front of me. It's like taking your best friend and going out and uh, they're getting hit by a car and they're dead. It, it, I had the same effect. It, it's just like going through the death process. I mean, all of a sudden you're slapped with a thing. It's not there, it's a belief. It's something that's ingrained in me. I believe this. This is, I centered a lot of things around this. And now all of a sudden, no, it's not. Life at OD Heck returned to the way it had been before facilitated communication. The clients learned the life skills they would need to survive outside. No longer were they expected to express their thoughts and wishes in complex sentences was like something had been taken away very, very suddenly, and I didn't know what to replace it with. It took, it took me, I think, months before I could talk about it with some people without breaking down in tears. There's the guy, there's, yes. Am I correct in assuming that in this study, in the experimental arm, the response was always reflective of what the f facilitator saw and never absolutely 100 180 times okay yeah with zero correct responses and there have been many other that studies by chance. <laughs> no I, we don't need to run a t-test on that or anything we're it's 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 good so yeah no i know but the but the point i'm getting at here for today is that these people did not realize that they were the ones doing it you know that they they had no feeling of doing when they in fact were doing it and so, so that's, this is getting back to the unreliability of our feelings. Here's another example, of course, of the same sort of phenomenon is the Ouija board. Whenever you have a situation where there are two people, at least two people involved, suddenly there's ambiguity. Am I doing it? Is he doing it? Or you know, what's going on? And I don't know how many of you know Mark Edwards. You know, so 
So here's a, here, here's a little bit from Mark Edwards as well, which sort of demonstrates the problem. Mark Edward is helping these volunteers use a Ouija board to reach out Never to the Never seen one with so many people on it. Grandpa, are you happy? And now this woman seems to be in a deep supernatural conversation with her deceased grandfather. Yes. That's good. Grandpa is happy. Are you starting to believe? So now how do you feel? I don't know. It almost makes me want to cry. I'm, I'm happy Aww. that he's happy. I don't believe her. More now? More now. Yeah, I doubted a little bit at the beginning, but after doing it and experiencing it, like, I, there's no way I can doubt it now, I think. At this point, we could easily let these people leave convinced they contacted the spirit world. No way you can doubt it. I don't think so, no. But for our final test, we're going to have the group reach out again, only this time with a little twist. What I have here are some blindfolds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Surely blindfolding our participants won't make a difference to the spirits. Okay. Or will it? I'm going to place the planchette in the center of the table. Now is going to be the moment of truth. Spirits, can you speak to us? Are you there? <laughs> right there? Kendall, Grandpa, show us that you're with us again. That's odd. Are the spirits drawing a blank? You know what year he died? Yes. Okay. What year did you die? Right there? Okay. <laughs> Here's the second number. How do you think our new believers will react when they find out the spirits are having some technical difficulties? <laughs> the third, one more, one more number. Okay. You can take your blindfolds off. Now, what year did he pass away? 2010. So this should be conclusive evidence at this point. Now, the spirits did a fantastic job without the blindfolds, but with the blindfolds on, this is what I got when you went for the date from Grandpa, who was so clear before, right? Here's what you got. You got a J and a K, and you got three blanks that were on the middle of the wood. There was no, no numbers here, here, or here. She looks like she just saw a ghost. <laughs> so what's going on here? Before, the spirits were answering their questions perfectly. Oh. <clears throat> Did they suddenly forget how to spell? And if everyone swears they aren't in control, oh, man. then who or what is moving the dial? So, yeah, another example, another example of I'm not doing it, but of course I am doing it. So, so this is, Wegner sort of puts it together this way uh, with psychologists like these, you know, two by two things. Uh, and so you have the, the doing or not doing on the left in terms of the actual thing of your actions of your body and the feeling of doing versus no feeling of doing. And so you have on the upper left, normal voluntary action, the feeling and the doing are going together, uh, and then normal inaction down on the bottom right. But then you have uh, case one, you know, the illusion of control when you're, you know, you're not doing anything but you feel as though you are, in the case of the joystick and the, and the buttons and uh, also superstitions and other examples that I give in the book. Uh, and then automatism where you, in case two, where you're you know, the FC or facilitated communication or the Ouija board. And, and so you know, the fact that, that we can be fooled so easily with respect to these feelings, to me also goes in the category of, of sort of uh, weakening the idea that free will is a real thing. It, um, yes. It, it seems remarkable to me that with a group of people moving this thing around, that we would get any coherent answer. I know. But they're lucky. It's I true. I don't understand that mechanism. I don't either. I don't either. I didn't, we didn't see as much of that part of it. I have a feeling that Mark kind of led them a little bit. You can you can see that he's working her up. He's sort of, are you sure? And 
you know, there, there are ways in which I think he may have coaxed her into believing yeah. at the early part, I'm not sure. But, uh, but certainly, I mean, I, we've all, many of us, I think, have played with the Ouija boards and you, with just two people, and you can see how that, that works. Uh, and there is an illusion there. This is, a, this is a little bit of neuroscience evidence that comes from the famous LeBay uh, experiment, which some of you may have heard about. It's somewhat controversial, but, but this, is a, this is a guy who, um, who figured out how to measure the a response in the brain that precedes an action. There's, there's something called the readiness potential that can be detected on, a, on an EEG, you know, when you're wired up to get electrical signals from the brain. And this potential starts before an action starts. You know, you, you, it, it precedes your making a movement. Like in this case, he has this, this little guy in the cartoon wired up so that, that if he flicks his finger, all he has to do is flick his finger and it will be recorded on that on the tape on the right, right? And, and, and then on the EEG, he will be able to detect this rising readiness potential. But what LeBay did that was, that was interesting was that he tried to then also add to that equation the conscious thought, the desire to move. So what he did is he, he set up, this thing on the right is a pretty good representation of the TV screen of a little clock he had. And it, it, the, the little triangle there, or whatever it is, the marker, would go around the circle of the clock uh, I think once once every couple of seconds or something, and uh, and so the person was asked to do from their point of view. The participant in this study was said thought told you know when you feel like it, when you have the urge, uh, flick your finger, right? Just just any flick of the finger, just one, one, and you do it spontaneously when you feel the urge to do it, right? And, but what we want you to do is to note the time on the clock at that moment when you have the urge to do it, right? when you first have that urge. So he, he was able to measure now three things, the start of the readiness potential the, that, that precedes the action and the conscious urge to flick. And what he discovered was, as, as the graph sort of suggests, is that the, that the readiness potential actually began before the person consciously felt like they wanted to move, right? So, so it suggests that the biology is going before the psychology, before the urge to do it, and there's a separation. Now, this is very controversial, and many people have tried to pick holes in it and suggest that it's, that it's, um, that it's not valid. In fact, LeBay felt as though himself that there were still circumstances in which there was free will even though the, his, his own experiment seemed to show otherwise. And so, uh, so it, it's a, just one more piece of evidence that has been put on the pile. And so now, I, I lied. I said that there was only one diagram. This is another diagram. This is a third, I think, by now. So I, I'm, I'm mistaken about that. Uh, and this one's quite complicated. But, but this is a, a version of Wagner's own diagram about how the illusion of, of our will works which is that, that you, know, you have all the various things, uh, time is moving to the right, and you know, all the various things that are impinging on us in any given moment, including our heredity and our experiences and whatever situation we're in at the moment. Uh, and that gives rise to, uh, you know, separately, thoughts, <laughs> thoughts and actions, right? And what he suggests is that, that when, and, and that happens unconsciously, right, on the left there. That, so whatever's causing the thought and whatever's causing the action is unconscious. What happens is that they both separately become conscious, but because thoughts come to us quicker than actions do, actions take more time than a thought, uh, we get the impression that the thought, which occurs first, is actually causing the action, right? And so the, the gray arrow there is to suggest that that, there, that that makes an apparent causal relationship between our thoughts and our actions, when in fact they're both arising separately from their own causes, but one a little bit ahead of the other, right? It's just like when you press the button in the elevator and if the door then closes, you know, the timing is such that we think we've, we've done it. 
So that's his model, um, and, and, I, and I adapted it slightly, and, and uh, I believe in it. Um, so here's the conclusions about this section, of, and I am getting close uh, to the end. Um, the, so most of our personal evidence about having cause and effect and, and having free will comes from a feeling. And what I'm suggesting to you is that that feeling is often wrong. And I've given you these various examples of, of uh, cases in which it is wrong. Um, but it is a useful delusion. And so I have to finally finish up by saying that there are many cases in which the delusion is, is valid and, and helpful. Uh, because, for example, you know, just being able to dis, dis, you, when your body moves, you know, you take an action. Uh, it's useful to know that you made it move versus something else making it move. So I give the example of the, you're driving down the highway and you're holding the steering wheel. The steering wheel goes to the right and you go off the road. It's useful information to know whether you did that yourself or is something else doing that. And, and the feeling of doing is what, what keeps us from you know, knowing that. Um, uh, it's also, and I think perhaps more importantly, true that we, we, do, we are a social animal. And, and the fact that we feel, we know that an action was something that came from us, or we, you know, we have that feeling, that makes us eligible for punishment. And, it, and there's the very, just, be, just because it's not free, doesn't mean that you couldn't, by the social group, be held responsible, responsible for it, right? Uh, not, not necessarily responsible in the philosophical sense of responsible, but you could be punished for it. You could, and that, that would be useful because the group could diminish that behavior in you and the group would, would, would uh, benefit from it. So, and, and of course, the feelings of guilt that people have and, or pride, all of those feelings, even though they're not really about you in the sort of free will sort of way, still are effective social control. So my, my view is that we, as a species, are very sophisticated, very social, and so we've acquired this as an evolutionary adaptation. I, think, I don't think it's a, a, mis, I don't think it's a, a side effect. I think it's, a, it was, it's built in as part of the machinery uh, to make us a more effective social, social species. And that's it. <laughs> Question about the, the facilitated communication um, experiment. So, so after all the communicators were were convinced that the process was bogus, was there any downside? Did it change how they dealt with their clients? Did it change how they accomplished whatever the purposes of the program were? Well, I mean, I have to say that this is like a special moment in time. I mean, we we wish today that people could be just shown this data and then, oops, okay, I changed my mind, it's not real. That doesn't work, unfortunately, it's not working that way. But uh, no, I think that they went back, they just simply, as they, as they suggested in the film, they went back to doing the stuff that was, in fact, evidence-based, uh, you know, uh, teaching methods that they had been using in the past. And not, did they get better results by dropping the bogus procedure? I mean, in other words, what were the consequences of, of showing everybody that what they were doing was completely worthless. The consequences for the client or for the both. Both. Well for the for the for the clients it meant that they were their time wasn't being wasted doing something that wasn't real and they were actually get going back to the education that So there was that, an outcome improvement well, by, I mean, yeah. by dropping that. Yeah, yeah, they, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it, it the the idea that they were speaking and writing in paragraphs was a an fantasy, illusion, right. an illusion. So, you know, truth is better than illusion in this case. <laughs> Not all cases, but, but uh, yeah, so, so uh, I think it was, a, it was a great improvement. But the problem is that, it, that you, you, I think that was a unique situation where the staff really trusted the, their psychologist to come through in the film, and they were willing to accept that data. Uh, many, many people today are using variations on this technique or the same technique, and they're not willing to accept, you know, they say, I know my truth, you don't, and, and that's the problem that we face, and we're working on it. Mm -hmm. Amy. 
Oh, I'm sorry. And you know what? This this is a small enough group. Okay. I think just you just right. call on okay. Mark. Mark had his hand Oh yes, up Mark, you did. Have first, your hand so let's do Mark and Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I guess I'm going back in my mind to that slide you had of uh, the universe and the yes. pale blue dot. Yeah. Um, and you know why on the left it it follows the laws of gravity and yeah. everything like that. And we assume through anthropomorphic reasons that we do not follow that. And obviously our history is written in such a way that everything is about us and <laughs> everybody else is different. Yeah. But there is one notion that it that the, that it kind of gets disposed of in, in the talk, and that is, uh, it, it is the ability to, to reason. It's the ability, it, sentience, mm -hmm. are is is the notion that you're describing to saying there is no such thing as sentience. Oh no, no, no not at all. No, uh, and uh, but our ability to reason is limited, and 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 we are fooled. Our our sense of reason can be fooled by other other things. So no, it's not not that at all. I mean I. I, I still believe that in, and I should have made that clear at the beginning, you know, in most parts of life, rationality is the way to go, right? And, and, I, and, I, and we, we wouldn't be in this room using all this equipment and having the experiences we have without human reason and, and, and sentience as well. Um, so, so no, it's just that, that this, you know, these examples that are in the book are ones where those things sort of separate, right? Where, where we do things, we do many things. I would say, for example, facilitated communication is an example of something that's irrational and not good. You know, belief in a flat earth, irrational and not beneficial, right? You believe in all these kinds of, you know, vaccines, blah, 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 all the examples, right? What, what I've done in this book is to identify a few cases where not for, I mean, in the case of free will, I believe we all benefit. In, in some of the other examples in the book, some people do it and some people don't, and yet it's clear that the people who do are benefiting from it. So, so um, I don't know if that answers the question. Well, I mean, I guess what I was trying to hit home was that sentience, to me, is, is kind of part of the course of saying I have a decision. I, I do have free will. I can make decisions. When in the example of the video game, for instance, um, the person noted, at first he thought he was in control, but then at some point, he did realize that he was not in control, and then put a quarter and then played the game and yeah. made decisions at that yeah. point. Yeah. So the very fact that he could distinguish one from the other, and in one case he was not making choices, and the other case he clearly was, True. then that says there is free will to me. Well, the, the, the problem, I mean, what's, other than that's an example where it's the case, what, but what about a, a case where the game doesn't correct itself and show you that it's in charge? In other words, that, that was a unique situation. Here we have people who've been using facilitated communication for, for years, and they, they've not come across, you know. So, so I, human reason is, is powerful, but it can be fooled. And I don't, I don't think that, I think, as I say, the strongest evidence that we have, that we have free will and choices, is a feeling. We have that feeling. And, uh, and that feeling is, you know, psychological, it's not reliable. And uh, I think it has benefits, as I say, but, uh, but it doesn't really, you know, the pale blue, blue dot is very small in, in relation to the rest, so. Thank you. Amy. So I guess like this gentleman, I, I want to push back a little bit about the just complete absence of free will. I believe obviously there are lots of constraints on our decision making, but to say we have none. And I wonder if the, two, the examples of the facilitators you talked about just a minute ago, where you have a group of facilitators in the movie who were presented with the information and then they were able to say, oh, this is not real, and make a change, you know, and change appropriately to go back to more evidence-based interventions, but now we have facilitators who refuse to test, refuse to face the evidence. So like, what is the difference between these two groups if it's not, I mean, obviously there is, a, there is more e external pressures on facilitators today not to participate in testing, but how is it, how is it explained on like a neurological level about the di totally different choices of these two groups in similar situations? Well, I mean, the, I think that clearly in the case of those who don't change their minds, their motivations are different, right? That, that, 
that the implications of changing their minds for them are, I mean, that's what we're dealing with now, is with people who, you know, these people, these people knew that if they've changed their mind at O.D. Heck, right, number one, they were going along with what their bosses said, and they weren't going to lose their jobs or anything. They were going to go. They were going to continue to work. It was a it was a horrible personal thing for them. But uh, you know, it's all of, so. Reason is combined with motivation, right? It, 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 there, there, that is, we reason. We use reason so that we can acquire our desires, right? And so, so the difference between people is often, I think, a result of the of the motivation. But but you know, the examples that you both are giving are cases where. We we are you know we are reasoning beings and we can suss stuff out and we can change our behavior according to that if we are rational and if we're driven by rationality. But I'm, I don't accept that personally. That doesn't prove anything about whether we're machines, billiard balls, or whether we're these you know we have this thing up here that is somehow controlling a non-material soul or something of that nature. Uh, I think that these are just different different situations in which we adapt or we don't, depending upon our circumstances and our, and our motivations. And that may not, I mean, I have to say, let me just say, I brought this to this group because I thought you were up to it, right? <laughs> I do not bring this topic to other groups because it's just too, it's too off the wall. And, uh, but it's a, it is a challenge. It, it, it doesn't come easily to, to people to believe that. But, but I also think like, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the themes of the book is Darwinism, right? In other words, the idea, the, the, the goal of, of natural selection is not to make the smartest species, the most rational species. It's to get to the next day. It's to wake up tomorrow, right? And, and so, so we have reason, and it's really good for a lot of things, but there are some things about us that are also good and help us survive to the next day that are against reason, that are not, you know, could, don't work in terms of a rational choice model. And that's, that's the, the underlying message of the book. That's the part that is consistent with skepticism and ration, you know, and our group. So. Others? Yes? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I like the uh, facilitated communication topic. I find this very interesting. Good. You should join us in helping to get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd very much like to do that. Uh, but it, it makes me wonder, um, um, who, who pays for this? Is it the insurance companies or the, the government, state government, federal government? If, if, I, I think uh, uh, follow the money and, and one can with a lot of solutions well, to this problem by Amy, Amy and Katie probably have answers to that. My sense is that most of it now is done by parents who have the have the ability to do it, who who hire facilitators uh, and and have have enough money to do that. They are attempting to get school systems to pay for it, and they have sued. There's a case locally in which uh, uh, parents are suing to try to get the schools to adopt it, and so far. Science and reason have won, fingers crossed. Uh, and yeah, that's reason. <laughs> <'cause that's, laughs> if you want to learn about fingers crossed, there's a book over here. Um, but uh, yes, anyone dipping their toes in gay conversion therapy? What do you mean? <laughs> it's false. Oh yes. Well, I, mean, I think it's. I think it's. Therapy? I think it's gone. I mean, I think gay conversion therapy is pretty well vilified at this point, and it's. <laughs> it's not. Um, no. Not, not really. Oh, really? No, I mean, there are a lot of communities, a lot of uh, entities that are supporting it. Really? Typ yeah, typically on the religious right. Yeah. Okay. I haven't heard that. I mean, obviously the American Psychiatric Association is is against it, and yeah, but it, it took almost fifty years for the. Well, APA to be against that's true. homosexuality that's true. too. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. Um, I have a question. I have a sure. question. So when I think of um, free will, um, just I just a little loud. Oh, I'm sorry. I speak a lot loud. I'm sorry. Yeah. So when I think of free will, I think of um, things such as like you know moral standards or ethical obligation, mm -hmm. or being able to distinguish um, a right from wrong, or just knowing that you have a choice in the matter. When we say that people don't have free will, I thought that was one of the things, similar to what you talking about with Darwinism, 
which separates us from our, I'll say different species that we can, um, we can create social systems, um, pretty much make choices and establish standards to pretty much separate us from them because they're more primitive than we are, obviously. Like so, <laughs> so I guess, although I'm not necessarily pushing back at the claim that we don't have free will, I'm wondering what is your opinion on people who, let's say, for example, pedophilia, for example, I don't know if you know this, but right now there are a lot of people who are trying to claim that pedophilia um, is actually a something that they can't choose or that they were born this way, similar to like homosexuality. Right. Um, and there are actually some people who are trying to use this defense um, when they go to court to pretty much get a lighter sentence or probably get sent to like um, an asylum of some sort. Right. So, um, and obviously a lot of people are against that because people will say, you know, you do have a choice as to, you know, whether or not to engage with a child or not. Yeah. So, in a situation like that, would you say that free will is something that could be present or should be, um, or they should be held responsible for not acting in a, I'll say, a social, um, within the social standards? Yeah, so I don't know enough about that specific example to be able to judge, but, but, there, but one of the things that affects uh, a, a society's view about punishment, for example, right, in, in a case where somebody has done this kind of behavior, is whether it's amenable to punishment or not. And so, so there are things, you know, if, if a person uh, has a disorder that literally they cannot, it, it's demonstrated empirically that they cannot stop doing it, then we contain them in some way rather than, or, or do some other way of, of dealing with them rather than expecting them a punishment to be effective. So I, I think that, uh, that, you know, what, what is the case is that where, where behavior is amenable to environmental changes, in other words, where we know that under another circumstance you might behave differently, right? Then there's more of an, an, an idea that we, we could, quote, hold you responsible or punish you for it. But you're getting into lots of issues like the insanity defense, you know, all of these kinds of things where people have attempted to use and I'm not, I'm not thinking so much in the legal sense. I mean, there are, there are ways in which our laws are supposedly uh, geared to letting people who have a mental disorder have a different path than someone who doesn't, right, in, in a legal context. And there are various theories as to why and whether that's the right thing to do. But, but I don't think that the fact that, uh, you know, again, remember that when the, the, when the act is heinous, when it's really bad, that's when we are most likely to want to say, you had a choice and could de do differently, because we are affected by that. We want to, we want to be able to, to punish the person, as in the case of the, of the, uh, of the uh, you know, the, the child that died in, in utero. Um, so I'm just uh, suggesting that it, you know, for all these reasons, I don't think it makes sense, and that we have to be particularly careful when we're talking about something really horrible, right, that the person has done, because our judgment of that is going to be clouded on, on, with respect to, to, we want them to have had a choice so that we can punish them. And that's more about us than it is about them in that case. I don't know if that answered your question or not. I have a follow-up, but I'll let this gentleman go. No, no, go, ahead. no go ahead. Okay, so, I think when we're talking about the punishment, we're dealing with the aftermath of the action that of which came about of the free will or of the choice to make the decision. So if we can prove, or if we know, for example, if I want to take a particular route to go home, let's say I take route A every day. Mm -hmm. If on this particular day I want to take route B, wouldn't that be a sense of me having choice or free choice, or in other words, free will? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you, you, it certainly is going to feel that way, right? But, but if you know, there are many choices, like, for example, you know, we, we make judgments about whether a, 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 an action is free or not. And the reality is, is that we're always making a judgment, whether, whether it's after the fact or not. We, you know, the action has happened, we're making a judgment now about whether it was free or not. It's done, but we, we, want, we want to either say it was impelled, it compelled, or that it was completely free. And, and how we feel about that action. Now what you talked about is going home A versus B, completely benign, has no implications for us. Now if you, you know, if you, something happened on A or B, 
we might change our view of what, of your choice and and feel as though you know you, you you know even more more of a case for you know being punished or not but but the fact that that sounds very arbitrary right i could go this way or i could go that way it feels much more free right it feels whimsical because in here here's part of the reason you could be you you know it's being affected by a very small thing a tiny you know effect it's not like someone took you at gunpoint and said you're going down path a right in which case in which case we you know that was not free will right we're not going to say it's free will right so that's you're on my side in that case uh, but the but but once you're in the realm of things that are under the control of very weak influences you're going to feel as though it's more more free but i don't think it proves that it is it's just that the the the, the valences the powers that are impacting you are much more weak and that's why we think of it as a as a arbitrary choice. I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not winning you over, I can tell. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I tell people all the time, um, you should never have a conversation with the intent of changing somebody's mind, but yeah. just to pretty much exchange ideas. No, yeah. that's not, <laughs> you're okay. good, I promise. Um, yeah. So, a word that you used that I found very interesting was compelled. Yeah. And when I think of um, compulsion or somebody being compelled, I think of a feeling, right? Now, a feeling can insinuate or can motivate you to act a certain way. Right, but the I'll say the the way of mm, how can I put this well? I, I like using words that I'm going to use later on or even earlier. I would say it can you can be compelled to act a certain way, but the act of actually reacting in a way that you feel compelled to react, I think that when it, that's when it comes down to choice. Or to give it an actual example, um, I like to use real example. I'm sorry. It's good. So. Right, you have a lot of, um, let's think of like couples, for example, right? You have a husband, or two, two people in a relationship, I should say, and let's say, you know, one of them is just, you know, for some reason, just nagging at the other one, and, you know, you have that one particular couple who may be compelled to physically react, unfortunately. Now, whether they should or shouldn't, I think that comes down to, you know, pretty much freedom of, um, freedom of choice or freedom to react, or in other words, free will. Because even though you're compelled to act a certain way for whatever reasons, could be something traumatic, could be emotional, you know, it could be that you're just fed up, I don't know, it could be a lot of reasons. But whether or not you do or don't react, I think that comes down to um, more ethical, more, more, uh, your moral standards, ethical um, obligations, and more specifically, consequences, also consequences, which also pretty much are things that we think about when we um, have the freedom of choice, or in other words, free will. Because we can do whatever, I always tell people, you can do whatever it is that you want, but you have to be able to deal with the consequences. It's one of the reasons why specifically my generation, the generation before me, has a problem with freedom of um, speech or the First Amendment, where it's like, you can say whatever it is that you like, but that doesn't mean that it's absolved of consequences. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that was kind of a, a, I'm sorry. a big story. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but what I would say, say is that it's all, all, everything you described was in a very uh, complicated social structure. Mm -hmm. And so all of those feelings about I should act, I shouldn't act, those come after a long history of being influenced by people, circumstances, and so forth. And so, so um, and I believe that's the source of the feeling. In other words, that it helps us in those contexts. You, you have to, we have, as part of the, you know, the feeling of reason, we have the ability to think and have second thoughts and not act exactly the same way if it didn't work that way in the past and so forth. So anyway, I'm not going to win you yeah, over. It's okay. it's it's okay. Okay. It's I think this guy was, which are you, I think you were next and then we'll get to you again. Well, yeah. Also, you were talking about are things reasonable or not actions and I have an example from, uh, I don't, know, I don't know if you know, Martin Seligman, he was a psychiatrist at the University of Pennsylvania. Yes. He, he studied optimism. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. had a study that's showing that, well, pessimists are actually more accurate than optimists, yeah. but they're unhappier. Yeah. And it's kind of examples you mm -hmm. can show is like the pessimist, I'm a pessimist, I say, I say some, you know, the, the have an optimist say, hey, I think the Phillies are going to go to the World Series. <laughs> and I say, no, I have every confidence they're going to screw up. <laughs> they won't make it to the World Series for at least another five years. Well, yeah. it turns out, being those kind of things, the pessimists were actually correct yeah. more often, but they were unhappier than the optimists right. who were always, yeah, the Phillies are going to make it. That concept is in 
chapter, well, like chapter two reasonable. or three, I think, in the book. Yeah, what's so, the reasonable way to think there? To think more accurately right. or to think something that will make you happier? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the evidence is, is fairly, you know, there's at least sufficient evidence for me that, that um, normal, healthy psychological functioning involves irrational optimism. And, and, that, and, that, and that realists, I mean, the people who are depressed are much more realistic. They, there's a famous article that I talk about in the book in which the subtitle of the article is uh, Sadder but Wiser, you know, meaning that depressed people are accurate about, about specifically about how much control they have over the world, right? Whereas, whereas optimists, which is most of us, uh, are, are overly confident about our ability to control events and to option the world. Another, another slight uh, you know, uh, argument in favor of my anti-free will case, but anyway. Let's other? get to Mike now. He's yeah, sure, Mike, right. thank you. So um, one of the dirty little secrets of medicine is that it's pretty much empirical rather than scientific. And I, I think back just in, in my lifetime when uh, if you looked at a biology textbook in the 50s, the number of chromosomes was different than 46. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, uh, again, in, in my lifetime in, in the 70s, if you told a, uh, a group of physicians that ulcers were caused by uh, an infection, nobody would believe you and you'd be laughed out of any medical society you belong to. Uh, so in, in that sense, is a, a person such as a Christian scientist who believes in the power of prayer over traditional medicine really wrong, and should they be prosecuted if they pray over a child who has meningitis or appendicitis or whatever and dies because they are following what they believe is the right pathway. Yeah, so actually there, there was, a, you may be familiar, there was a case in, in Canada where a couple were nat naturopaths, uh, and I think the child had meningitis, and uh, uh, biologic, the bad form, and they did not take him to the hospital until he stopped breathing or something, right? right. Uh, and instead, they gave him some naturopath, and they were they were brought up on charges uh, in Canada. I don't know whether that would happen here in the that's, U.S. That's, or not. That's exactly it's what's happened lots of times. It has. Okay. Yeah. Based on we, naturopath, we, or we had, based um, on not providing care for yeah. 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 Here in years ago or so. There was some cult in Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah. A bunch really? of kids. Uh, I've got uh, measles, and, and a lot died from that. It was an unusual number died from, yeah. from that disease. And were parents brought up on charges or something? Or yeah, it was for not yeah, vaccinating. So. For not vaccinating. Really? Yeah, a religious yeah. call. Wow. That, oh, that was the thing. And That's for interesting. For not but also for not getting care when the kids yeah. Yeah. were. And Paul, Paul Offit um, of CHOP was right. on the team that actually went into the neighborhood to rescue the children. Oh, wow. And he wow. talks about wow. this yeah, in some of his books. Yeah. And he's spoken to fact multiple times. Yeah. So he, so, yeah. That's great. So he's terrific, by the way. Uh, I, I, I'm going for the Paul Offit record on a number of talks on <laughs> Skeptical Inquirer Presents. But uh, the, um, yeah, so I think uh, obviously uh, I don't think that it's appropriate for someone to neglect normal, what we now consider to be the best, uh, you know, knowledge on, with respect to medicine, in in and in pray instead. Um, uh, the, so taken from the child's welfare point of view, uh, obviously it's important to do the the regular things, right? That we all we all now know how to do. Now, if the parent also prays, you know, and that helps the parent in some way. It's obviously not going to help the child. That's a whole other question, and so... Well, all right, you, you say it's not going to help the child, but there are some studies which show that people who are prayed have a better rate of, or prayed for, have a better rate of recovery than those who don't. Uh, e even people who do Intercessor, don't know, yeah, 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 I, mean, I think that, 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 I've seen uh, some of those which studies. Which is terrible. I don't think, yeah, but I don't think they're very good studies. Oh, okay. only if so, so let me add one more corollary to that, and that's... I mean, I'm not against praying. If they want to <laughs> pray, that's fine. I pray not. But, but I... <laughs> so let me, let me add one corollary to that, and that's with Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that if they get blood, they will not go to heaven. Oh. And as a consequence, medicine has moved away from providing blood 
and has looked for alternatives which have been effective in many cases mm -hmm. for Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and they wouldn't routinely die from something where they would bleed out because these alternatives have worked. So in a sense, the, the people who have this belief system, which may or may not be according to traditional science, right. have, have proven that you know, maybe their way wasn't wrong. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, anything that pushes us in, in productive directions is, is good. It's still, it's still all rational, even though their belief may not be. But, uh, That's but, rational to them, though. Yeah, exactly. I'd like to make a quick comment on uh, what he said about the prayer. I see, I've seen one in, like, Omni Magazine study where they showed people praying for it. It says the group that was sick and, and they were told people are praying for you, right? They actually did better than the group that... Right. They had people pray for them, but they never told them that. Right. They didn't know. And I thought like, yeah. that was interesting that the people, yeah, were, were yeah. Told, people are praying for you. People care about you. They did better. I heard the reverse. Yeah, I heard the reverse. People who knew they were being prayed for actually did worse. Oh, really? Because it was like too much pressure. Too much pressure. Poor experimental design, yeah. right? Okay, we got a couple more here. This person hasn't had a question yet. I'm sorry, I can't believe. But I'd like to know if we believe that there is no such thing as failure or freedom of choices, what are the certain conditions? Do you think they should you think be held accountable for what they do? Yes, I think they can be held accountable. Obviously, not in, not in the sense that they caused what they did, but in the sense that, that if you behave that way, then it may not benefit us as a group. We're all living in groups, right? And we're all li we all depend on each other. And so, so if we as a is if the group can create a a, a, a standard of behavior, uh, then it can reward or not. And so in a way, you think of the group as an organism, right? That is is trying to survive. And so so it, it learns to isolate people who don't help the organism, reward people who do help the organism, and so forth. So, so I think that's part of the reason why we, we have this instinct, this feeling, is that it helps to the group to, to, um, to establish standards of behavior and, and so on. Does that make sense? OK, I've got another in the back row, and then we'll get back to you. So the way I I understood is that so somehow our action are being detained, right? That's right. So by the nature, for example, by the nature. By nature. By nature. Yes. So in that case, like with free will, if there is no free will, so that means anybody, like nobody, can be can be accountable for the action. See, that's what people think. That's what people would say. It's, it's sort of like saying, you know, the analogous situations that many people objected to the idea that there must be a God because without God, anything is allowed, right? You, know, the, it's, it, you can do whatever you want, you know? Uh, and, 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 the, and that is the, you know, because we use the sense of free will uh, and the sense of choice to punish or hold people responsible, People think that that must mean it's real, right? And and in in a real sense that you cause, but um, but as I say, we can still, I believe, because of the illusion, because of this feeling that we have, like I you you tell me I did something bad, I have a feeling that I did it, right? And you now you've told me it was bad, right? So that is a situation in which. I, as an individual, can easily be held responsible, even though I didn't really do it. It was caused by something else, but it didn't get rewarded by my group. My group says it's bad, so it's not really my fault, right? But but I am being told by my group, don't do that again, right? And and hopefully that will that will happen because we can adapt. So that's sort of the way I see it. Does that make sense? Yes. Are you familiar with the movie The Truman Show? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it in quite a while. I haven't either, but this yeah. talk has kind of reminded me of it a little bit in that, um, for those that don't know, it's a movie where um, a, a child was uh, adopted by 
of all things, a, a, a company. <laughs> yeah. And he's raised basically all of his interactions to any human beings are forced. And he's raised exactly a certain way. Everything is controlled about the way, and televised, by the way, uh, much, he doesn't realize he, he's, he's being televised, but okay. yeah. everything is controlled. The point I guess I'm, I'm asking is that do you personally believe that if you could control for all the var variables, or you understood all the variables that were in someone's life, you could accurately predict everything they would do? Yeah, Absolutely. I mean, it's an impossible task, but yes, I do. I mean, I, I, I used to, I taught a course, an entire course on the, on the psychology of free will once, and I, and, I said to my, and I said to my students, by the end of this course, I'm gonna get you to believe that what's coming out of my mouth right now started at the Big Bang. <laughs> and, it, and it ended right here, right? And uh, I mean, that's an overly dramatic way of saying it, but, but I, I do believe that, that, I mean, let's put it this way. If you cut out us and a few other species, that's true about the rest of the universe. And the universe is really big, right? And so it's true about so much of the universe. It's hard for me to believe that somehow, as I say, that there's a special rule just for us. And uh, and so so yeah, I do believe that it's it, I, I, I we need a really big supercomputer to figure it all out. But I do believe that. We got one back here. I think we should hold up and finish up pretty soon. But yes. So I'm just wondering if we think that we don't have freedom of choice, how that makes it even more If we did have, I think it would be actually about the same as it is now. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't change our, we have the illusion, right? We have the illusion, it probably would be similar, but, but it just, you know, it would, it would, I don't know how, I don't know how it would work, that's the problem. I just don't know how, you know, again, it's like the cartoon, you know, is the thing just floating out there or what? We don't know how it would work, but, but, uh, yeah. So, okay. Well, thank you very much. It was great to be here. I loved your questions. Thank you for your minds. And there are books here if you want to buy them at discounted prices.